Hello, Christina. Hi, Melissa. How are you? I'm doing okay. Doing okay. I'm super excited that we have connected today to talk about being a Hellraiser and uh, racism and doing the work and all those things. So thank you so much for being here with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yes. So do me a favor and introduce yourself to my audience and tell people who you are and what you do. Sure. So my name is Christina Wright. I am a communication strategist uh, in out of Houston, Texas. Uh, I do uh, strategies for nonprofits primarily. Uh, and I've, I have had right now results for the last four years. You know, sometimes in business, you just don't, it's like, it's like, oh, has it been one year or 18, right? <laughs> So I constantly have to check my paperwork. <laughs> so, so we are four years old uh, and I work with nonprofits to help them get these very complex missions, m messages about their missions out to uh, the general public, to their donors, Donors so important, especially right now. Uh, so uh, this year we launched uh, a new uh, online driven uh, cost efficient uh, membership site that allows you to put together your own communication strategy uh, within your within your organization because uh, most of our organizations don't have you know fifty thousand dollars to hire an expert to come in and do it for them. Right. And so uh, through COVID, we pushed that project up. And then the one that we'll talk about probably a lot today is the new arm. Uh, it is PS and it, there's a blank right now. So if you see this, uh, go on my Facebook page. I have the four top choices uh, to fill in that blank. Uh, but just a little bit about PS. It is a diversity arm of right now results. And it stands for problem or solution. I believe we can either stand in the problems that were caused by the generations before us, or we can create solutions for the generations to come behind us. And considering the 2020 uprisings, it's about time. You know, the first class is called PS. It's been 400 years. And I think that says it all. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it really does. It yeah. really does. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, in a in a very big nutshell, that is me and right now results. Oh, I forgot. I used to be a reporter for quite some time. I forget that part sometimes. <laughs> I love that we were just talking about you being a reporter too, and, and right. a little bit. You're like super, like what's happening? So, <laughs> so um, how did you get into your work, especially with the uh, PS with with the project to really start to address how we are tackling? racism like how did you get into your work and what made you decide that you wanted to be in that part of your business so i am a woman of faith uh and so my short answer is god yeah uh it really is uh you know no matter who you believe in i do believe that there are you know divine uh entities that are pushing us towards a higher purpose and i think honestly ps is where he always wanted me to be uh, you know, I have always been a trainer, even when I was in the newsrooms and then as a communication specialist. And then this year, 2020, just really kicked up a lot of um, insights for me. You know, I have, I am mixed. I am Black, white, and Hispanic. Uh, so I have a very interesting uh, association with race. Uh, and I found myself this year sitting in a lot of conversations with usually white women trying to understand exactly what the systemic racism thing is about. Like, how does it feel? How does it really affect you? And I realized that that's what I've always done. I've always sat either with my black friends or my white friends or my Hispanic friends. And I'm like, okay, so think about it like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. I'm so glad you're doing it. And I'm so glad you're giving us the opportunity to become affiliates in that work. I think that's also really, really lovely. Um, yes. And just for people who are watching this, we'll make sure that there are links in the comments um, when we post the video so that you can connect to Christina and all her awesome work. So why, I mean, you brought this up a little bit, but why is now a good time to raise some hell? Oh man, it's just time. Like 400 years, I don't know about anyone else, but I got, can I use curse words on this podcast? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, so she's like, yeah, of course, all those. So it just really pissed me off 
when I looked up and I realized like the depths of like how ingrained oppression and racism is into our system. And then not only that, but how it's affected me and everyone in my life, no matter what color they are, no matter what class they are, you've been affected by these things that were established 400 plus years ago. And we claim to be this, you know, progressive nation that, you know, is going to somehow lead the world. We ain't leading smack down. <laughs> <laughs> we're not leading anything we've got i mean it is so it's in everything even if you will look at trump release oh i'm so mad so trump released an executive order last month have you seen that mm -mm. oh it's so dangerous it's so dangerous it is telling it is it's saying that any uh, organization or entity that receives federal funding cannot have certain types of diversity training. But hold oh, on. Oh, I did see that. Oh, like, and the thing is, it's so dangerous because the language is. I mean, he. And let's be real. Hyper racist language. Like, let's just be honest. Like, it's like so racist. Oh, so and it's like, oh, it calls it calls diversity training scapegoating. We're scapegoating white people. In what way? I know my diversity training doesn't do that. I know that me sitting here and telling a white person, like, look, you have implicit biases, and we just have to recognize that so that we can move forward. You have to understand other communities in order to establish systems that truly do make sense for them. That's not scapegoating anyone. That's telling the freaking truth. <laughs> no, I actually, I love this because I actually had a moment. I was cleaning the kitchen. My husband and I had had an argument and I was cleaning the kitchen and I was thinking, I've been doing a lot of, I just finished reading Conjure Women, mm -hmm. this really gorgeous book that was set in right before, it goes back and forth in time, right before the civil war and right after like the year before and the year after in this, it, on this plantation. Mm -hmm. really phenomenal book Sounds good. I'll conjure women so good yeah. and then I've been watching underground which I never watched when it was on tv I've been watching underground on hulu which is all about the underground railroad right and Harry oh, have you seen the so, Harry Tubman so, episode oh yeah oh yeah oh, oh my god it was all so the white good. people dear white people please read <laughs> conjure women and please watch this show but here is the, so it's on my mind this idea of white supremacy and maintaining these patriarchal structures for white men. And here was the thought I had, Christina. The first thought I had in my head was, okay, so I'm indigenous, right? So I am part Native American. And I just learned that my grandmother's grandmother, how she was murdered. She was murdered um, mm -hmm. by the pioneers in Utah. So I just mm -hmm. learned that like three weeks ago, I never knew. Uh, we talk often about how black women carry that generational trauma. So I'm carrying the generational trauma of my grandmother's grandmother. That was exactly what I was thinking. Black women carry generational trauma from being, and black men too, right? From being oh. slaves, right? Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Hispanic and Latin folks carry generational trauma from having their lands taken by white people. I mean, you know, it's a thing. Yeah. And the, gener the general, so you what know. Is the generational thing that white men carry and this is what I was thinking while I was cleaning the kitchen That's well so we all have generational trauma in one way or another unless mm -hmm. you're a white straight man yeah and the generational thing that you are carrying as a white straight man is the expectation that people will call you yes massa and no massa and yes sir and mm -hmm. no sir and yep. they will not argue with you yep it's not conscious it's not, you know, it's not conscious, our generational trauma. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you at that moment, it actually made it easier for me to understand why my husband does some of the stupidest shit ever. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of me. It's because of that generational expectation that mm -hmm. they will always be listened to. Yep. Yep. In fear, always. by the way. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not because out of not out of respect but out of mm -hmm. fear. yep that is what white men are battling right now oh, and thanks. i really think that is the conversation for us to start having to push it a little bit right yeah. like, oh oh do you have this 
settle expectation that we're just going to do everything you ask us to? You know, I test that. I, I, I am a troll sometimes. I really am. <laughs> I mean, part of the times that I am trolling, it is really going after white men. And they get so angry. And a little piece of me is like, you know what? Well, <laughs> That's what you get. Like the petty bone in me just like goes to work because, you know, in what, you know, how do you in any way, and yeah, you say, you know, you're right. It is very much subconscious, but the way that they walk through life and then to sit through the history that's being said to us, the media isn't all stupid. They don't all just report whatever it is that they want to report. So you think that these history books and you think that all this media is coming out and they're telling you that you have some implicit biases. You think everyone's wrong. But then, like you said, that's their generational curse. Yeah, that's I really their- think so. I think if we started talking about it that way, people would be like, oh, I get it. Like, yeah. I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. Well, first, we've got to get them to understand to believe in generational trauma. You know, I have conversations about that too, that, you know, there's no way that you could. And to be honest, I think I've told you this before that, you know, there was some time in my life that I spent like, oh, (laughs) pshaw. Everyone just needs to just chill out because I live in this very, like, we are the world and everyone loves everyone. And I know that these things are not true, but I wish that they were, which is why I do, you know, why I'm doing PS. Um, But, you know, I spent some time where I was the person that was like, systemic racism, guys, like, just do your best, do your thing, you'll be fine. Well, here I am 34 years old, and I'm looking back on the trajectory of my life and the fact that that's really not the truth. And that a lot of my traumas really, truly are not just my traumas. They are traumas from, you know, the generations before me that I'm associating with myself, you know, and and the way that we go, that I go through life. So first, we've got to get them to understand that generational trauma is actually a thing. (laughs) You feel your traumas? And I think that this leads actually really lovely into my next question I wanted to ask you about what do you wish others knew about disruption? Because what you just brought up was the, your disruption of your thinking, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so what do you wish others knew about this process of disruption, especially when it comes to disrupting our thinking about race and racism? Don't believe shit that you think that you think. <laughs> Nothing's true. Uh, And you know that actually I'm working on a keynote and it's this idea that we were all all sold this box. Have I told you about the box? No. Tell us about the box, Chris. We were all sold a box. Look, I feel like Martin. (laughs) Get it. (laughs) Tell us about the dream, Martin. Tell us about the dream. (laughs) Go. (laughs) So this, we were all sold this box and inside of this box, we were told all of the things that are so-called right. You know, go to school, get good grades, get involved in your community, find a nice young man, you know, get your degree, graduate, success, happiness. Boom. It's that easy. But we were sold a box. (laughs) Just know that that box, whatever you were told about what is so-called right, is not right. Because there is, once we graduate or, and it all kind of happens for people at different places. You know, for me, it was like, once I graduated, a few years later, I started realizing this actually isn't what I wanted. You know, this is- Graduated from high school or college? uh, College. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I graduated from college, I, you know, I knew that it would be really hard being in journalism and being in middle of nowhere. Uh, But I did not realize how much I would miss a lot of things and how much I would really not appreciate being part of the people who were telling the stories of what was happening as opposed to being part of the situations that were happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for me, it just started to, huh, this box explode. Huh, this is not it. And then once your box explodes, you know, once you, your, your thought process, once your thinking is disrupted, your box explodes. And we all go through this like tornado of like, oh my gosh, where am I going? What am I doing? This is all crazy. What's right? Because we've been taught in the box that we've got to seek the right way. But the reality is there are no rights. There are absolutely <laughs> 
There's not a single right. You, there are no right ways for you to pursue your purpose or for you to think that others should pursue their purpose and what they should be doing, you know, the way that they should be pursuing their lives, the way they go through lives. There's no real right answers. There are wrong answers, but here, here's the qualifier. The, right an, the wrong answers also only depend on you. So for me, my wrong answer goes along uh, Ten Commandments. You know, I was raised by faith-based people. So, you know, anything that's got me stealing, lying, killing, you know, Ten Commandment violations, that's wrong for me. Now, for other people, maybe you think there are certain instances where it's okay for you to lie or for you to steal. I don't subscribe to that. But if it's right for you, if it feels right to you, then it just is right. And ultimately, we have to decide that there are higher powers that are going to order our steps and lead us in the direction that we're supposed to go in our thought process and in our actions. Yeah, I have this. Um, I have this conversation a lot with myself and Jesus. Jesus and I talk about this pretty regularly. I'm like, so, um, and it came up because a couple months ago, someone was like, Missy, you're sort of remind me of Jesus when he just flips over the table and he's like, I'm done with all you people. Like, get it together. Just yeah. get it together. Like, That's how I feel. Get it together, right? <laughs> and so, um, and I often imagine that sort of how Jesus sounded at that moment. Like, what is your problem? Right? What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm bending the table, right? Because sometimes I just feel like I really want to do that. And then I have these really lovely friends um, who are, have been doing Christianity way longer than me. And they're like, I don't think that's what he was doing. And I'm like, well, actually, I totally think it is. So there, and this is where the rub is, right? Like, well, what I think is wrong and what you think is wrong are sometimes are two completely different things. If we can't agree that the 10 commandments are a great idea and probably a nice litmus test for how we're behaving in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because everybody has sort of this weird threshold for that. So I love that you're bringing that up because I think it is, it's the critical piece that causes us not to be able to talk to each other when we don't agree with each other. Mm -hmm. and I also think, Christina, that it's also the reason that white people are so terrified of saying the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because we've set this up to be a right or wrong, all or nothing, black or white thing. When the truth of the matter is, this is ugly and yeah. messy and 400 years of gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of way ill. Of way bad things. I mean, when you think about, I sometimes I sit and I think, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I, I we talk the same way. I also have conversations with Jesus. We just sit and we have conversations, and it's like, what were you leading? Like, what were your directions to these people? Because I feel like they didn't follow them. I feel like there's no. <laughs> What were they doing? Like when you look at the rules, I mean, there's the black people are three fifths of, you know, a person and you have, and it is, um, they had studied and decided full heartedly that different races of people experience pain differently, experience life differently, have, you know, they're just dumb. So Jesus just created a bunch of humans and only the white men are smart. <laughs> when there weren't really a whole bunch of them floating around when Jesus did all this stuff. They, they wasn't even in the talks, but now white Jesus is a thing, girl. You didn't know? Jesus white. Sean, my 10-year-old, literally, the, like last night, no, two nights ago, we were laying in bed and he goes, Mom, like we were getting ready for him to go to bed and we just finished reading and he goes, how come people think Jesus is white? Oh, I love that. And I go, I don't know, buddy. And he goes, they're just getting that history all wrong, Mom. There weren't white people oh. over there. That gives me hope, though. Good job. Yeah, he's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby, right? Like, yeah. that talk a lot. I'm like, oh, just you yeah. wait. It's probably like, coming for you, buddy. Yeah. I mean, it blew my mind, honestly, because I was not raised in the church in the way that a lot of uh, Black kids are. Mm -hmm. I was raised to believe in Christ because my mother was Catholic, my dad was Methodist, and so they really couldn't decide on which religion, and on top of it, they were both sick of going to church every Sunday. Right. So I was given the, you know, I was given the belief in Jesus and I didn't have to study the Bible, 
like that. I didn't mm-hmm. study Bible verses. And so for me, it was media that depicted Jesus to me for a long time mm-hmm. until I was in college. And, you know, I had my bestie. She just brought me a fan. So wonderful. Um, but my bestie was, you know, the, the kid with, that was raised in church and knew all of the Bible verses. And so when she started telling me about these Bible verses that actually prove that Jesus is not white, I'm like, well, hold on. <laughs> ham has been going on around here who decided to color this man a certain way then you know but i guess it makes all the sense in the world it's just and that is how ingrained our media is you know and that's why i'm using as part of our ps courses and trainings i'm using pop culture we are going to watch tv shows and movies that we have forever seen and then we're going to discuss the systemic oppression that are in that are in them uh you know, it's been around us this entire time. Mm-hmm. It's Imagine been- my shock, Christina, when I was like super excited because I got, I found an app where my kiddo could watch all of the Looney Tunes cartoons. I was so excited. Right. And then we started watching them and Sean's like, this is hor- horrible, mother. It's so racist. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh my God. It's terrible. Our, the Looney Tunes cartoons are so racist. And I was like, oh. Oh, you can't watch this. And he's like, I don't want to watch it, mom. I can't believe I'm like, well, you have to watch the Hoss and Pepper episode with the witch because that's a really good one. But you can't watch any of the other ones because they're terrible. I was just mortified. Oh, yeah. Images that I loved growing Mm -hmm. up are terrifyingly racist, right? But I love that my 10 year old, he doesn't need the cue. He's like, mom, this is crap. Like, I'm not watching. So much hope. It It does give me hope. If if we could all just raise our children to identify these small, subtle, racist, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we have hope for the next generation. I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think we've got, and that's why I want to do PS the way that I'm doing it. Yes. Because the objective is really not to change for gener- for the current generations. Right. The reality is that we are in what we're in. And the way that our government is set up, it moves slowly. So the changes that we're making right now are truly not for us. And part of them are not even for the kid, for our, you know, for our kids. They're for our kids' kids. You know, and their kids for generations, you know, the 400 years after if we screwed it up for 400 years. Let's do better the next 400. Yeah, let's take the next 400 years if the planet survives that long. Yeah, also true. That's a whole. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked about your faith, but how do you use your intuition in your work? A lot of times when I'm working with my clients, I, t- I really try to help them hone in on their intuition and what their intuition tells them. So how do you use your intuition in your work? Oh, whew. that is a process. That's a journey. Mm-hmm. That is a journey. Uh, for once you once you get out of the box, you got to let the box go. Once you get out of the box and you get through that tornado, uh, I think you come to a place where you just let your steps happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I am launching an entire business in the middle of a freaking pandemic while I was already, uh, you know, expanding my first business. Um, and every step of the way, I mean, I'm putting together a business plan. I am now in a pitch competition. There are like all of these things that are, ha- that are happening. I didn't plan for shit. Yeah. Not nothing. <laughs> I, feel <laughs> I feel that so hard. <laughs> and like, you know, if you met Christina 10 years ago, that would be an absolutely not. You know, I always had my five-year plan and my one-year plan and my six-month plan, and I was following it. And even if I got off, I was reviewing the plan. That's unnecessary. If you truly trust your intuition and you trust in whatever divine, you know, interventions that you trust in, all of, all of that is going to fall into place on its own. You know, uh, the pitch competition. I'll tell you about how that one came up, came about. <laughs> so I, you know, one day something came across beginning of COVID and it was um, a Black Girl Ventures. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do in this thing. At this point, PS did not exist. And so I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do in this group. So I show up to co-working. I'm going to co-working about a month and a half later. Someone says, hey, anybody come to pitch practice? What's pitch practice? I don't have anything to pitch, but I'll come. It felt good. My spirit said to me, just go. Check it out. Just go do this. 
And I went and I checked it out. And for the long, for the last two months, I had been doing a sales pitch. Uh, and then the pitch competition came around. And one of the ladies was like, your pitch is really good. If you convert it over to an investor pitch, you probably could compete. Meh, let's see how this goes. And so I started playing around with it. I applied for the competition. And now I'm in a competition that may allow me to get $200,000 for a two year runway on a business that came out of nowhere because I trusted my intuition the entire time. Yes. And I love that question. Let's see how this goes, right? It's not, yeah. no, this is shenanigans. Yeah, you're saying, because they're not in the box. Let's see how this goes. Let's see how this goes. Let's see how this goes repeatedly asking that question per beautiful little nugget that mm -hmm. is so good let's yeah. see how this goes like when it feels good and it makes you feel like a glitter bomb just went off in your head you're like hmm, let's see how this goes yeah. it. and, uh, and okay. it becomes a lot easier once you let go of the construct that there is a right and there is a wrong there are Ooh. 20 million ways i could have gone about building another business tons of different ways sure. i chose to just let it be completely intuitive Woo! <laughs> magic i love it i love it i love it so much okay so the last question i have for you is i mean we are like steeped as of this recording for those of you that are watching this in the future we are in the middle of october of 2020 and let's just say this year has not gone the way we planned not at all. And, no, not even a little. Um, but that there are so many opportunities to see evolution and shifting and changing and beauty in this world. Mm -hmm. So what is making you smile right now? Uh, honestly, feeling free. Mm. Just yeah. feeling, I feel so much me than, I was so much more like me than I ever have. And, you know, honestly, 2020 helped with that because sitting and, you know, the 2020 uprisings, they were hard for all of us. Every last one of us. I think no one got through that unscathed, even the white men who want to deny that it's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it allowed me to truly process a bunch of crap, oh. a bunch of things related to, you know, generational traumas related to, I have been arrested four times, like non like I mean, I didn't rob, kill, steal, none of those things. But systemic racism has me arrested for things like um, traffic ticket warrants. I, I mean, what do you want me to do here? And I had not realized how much that has impacted me, how much I had been holding on to. Uh, and then the other thing is this whole idea of how we're supposed to show up in the world. Yes. You know, code switching and how we appear. That has been so deeply ingrained in me. And when we were forced to sit our butts down, be with ourselves, I got to explore what it is that I do and do not like. I don't actually like showing up where I have to speak so-called proper English. I don't. Now I speak well. You know, I quote a lot of things because I'm a reporter, so. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> you know, I do speak so-called well, but that's because I was raised by certain people that just believed in pronouncing words certain ways. But I also was raised in a generation that's all about, you know, this pop culture and there's slang words and all of that. I have always been that person sitting on the daggone wall like, oh, I don't know. I don't know those things. I'm not hip. No, I know them. I know them. I heard them in the daggone song. I just act ignorant because it's not so-called proper. Uh, so what makes me smile this year, honestly, is being able to show up to a podcast with two different lenses and my hair in a big bush and still be able to sell organizational diversity training. That's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, what is inside of here didn't change because my hair is not up in a bun and I don't have on, you know, little black glasses. <laughs> Your glasses are epic, by the way. They're so good. They, so they, good. they give me life. Like They're every day. They make me feel I so much. <laughs> it makes me wish I wore glasses. So I can get them and copy you. Good. You um, should well, I, my eye, let's be real, I'm 46. So my mother was told the absolute truth when she was like, so you're going to need readers. And I was like, no, I, 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 well, I'm getting to the point actually where I need bifocals. So I'm going to stop resisting and get cool glasses like yours and then everything will be fine. 
So you skipped even single vision and got all the way to double vision before you just... I may have denied the readers part for a long time. Like they're getting, it's getting bad up in here. Really bad. Oh man, Hellraisers are stubborn. That's right. We sure are. Um, thank you so much for being here, Christina. If people want to find you online, where is the best place for them to connect with you? Best place is going to be Facebook. Uh, it is, uh, you can find me, Christina.m, right? Uh, and on any of the platforms, any of them, because I've been uh, picking one up at a time as they've come out. So uh, it's right now 86, right? W R I G H T. Right now 86. I love it. <laughs> Hang tight. Thank you so much for being here, Christina. For those of you um, who are also looking for inspired intentional action and how to find your voice in all of this, you can go to my website at naturalbornrebel.com and download my free ebook called Natural Born Rebel. There's a bunch of really fabulous tips in there for you about how you can find your voice and make a change in your life and your community. Thank you so much for being here, Christina. No problem. Thank you for having me.